gift it's found. Can we sing that again? Guardian and keeper. Guardian and keeper of my soul. Lay to rest to make for us a The blameless son and perfect cornerstone. All my sin, your sacred gift atoned. Oh, the precious blood of Christ. How it held me through the night. Oh, it brought.
Good morning. Today is a day of celebration. It is the crowning moment of Christianity. We celebrate the miraculous and victorious resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. The reason it's such a celebration is everyone who's been born from creation until now died. And their natural bodies perished in one way or another. Only two recorded exceptions to that are in the Old Testament. Enoch, in the Old Testament, the book of Genesis, the scriptures say he walked in close fellowship with God and one day God took him. We don't know all the details of that. The other was Elijah, who the scriptures say was taken to heaven in a chariot of fire and carried by a whirlwind. Neither one of them died a physical death. And though Jesus rose Lazarus from the dead after four days, he still died later on. So we know that every person that has ever experienced physical life experienced physical death. Those that had that happen to them on this planet are still dead, <laughs> except one. One is victorious over death. One defeated death, and one has the testimony that reads this way. Revelation, the first chapter. Here's the testimony of our Lord Jesus Christ. John is on the Isle of Patmos. He has a revelation of Jesus. And here's what he says in Revelation 1, 12. When I turned to see who was speaking to me, I saw seven gold lampstands, and standing in the middle of the lampstands was someone like the Son of Man. He was wearing a long robe with a gold sash across his chest. His head and his hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like flames of fire. His feet were like polished bronze refined in a furnace, and his voice thundered like mighty ocean waves. He held seven stars in his right hand, and a sharp two-edged sword came from his mouth, and his face was like the sun in all its brilliance. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as if I were dead, but he laid his right hand on me and said, don't be afraid. I am the first and the last. Now listen to these words. I am the living one. I died, but look. I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and the grave. Let me read verse 18 again. This is the testimony. I am the living one. I died. It's very important. I died. But look, I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and the grave. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that your word is inspired and errant and infallible. Today, as we look at the wonderful celebration of your resurrection, Lord, I pray it would just awaken our hearts to the beauty of the life of Jesus Christ. Today, give us ears to hear and hearts to apply your precious word. And as always, make us good soil that the seed of your word might go deep into our hearts and bring forth 30, 60, and 100 fold. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. I am the living one. I died, but look, I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and the grave. That is the words that are spoken by the Lord Jesus Christ. He's making an announcement to John, and he's saying to John, years after the fact, I want to remind you, I defeated death, hell, and the grave. I want to take a journey back and look at the scriptures, and let's get the story of that great happening this morning. In Luke, the 24th chapter, the Gospel of Luke, where we will read these words concerning the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But very early on Sunday morning, the women went to the tomb taking the spices they had prepared. They found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance, so they went in. But they didn't find the body of the Lord Jesus. As they stood, they there puzzled, two men suddenly appeared to them, clothed in dazzling robes. The women were terrified and bowed their faces to the ground. And then the men asked, why are you looking among the dead for someone who is alive? 
He isn't here. He's risen from the dead. Remember what he told you back in Galilee, that the Son of Man must be betrayed into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and that he would rise again on the third day. Key phrase, he isn't here. He isn't here. He has risen from the dead. He isn't here. He has risen from the dead. Those are the crowning words of the church of Jesus Christ. That, those words are the mantra, if you will, of Christianity. He isn't here. He's risen from the dead. Now, those great words, though, come as an answer to a question that is asked right before. And the question, why are you looking among the dead for someone who's alive? Why are you here looking among the dead for someone who's alive? That answer is obvious. Because it's obvious to the angelic visitors because they dwell in the spiritual realm. That's the realm that they are always in. They dwell in the supernatural realm of God. They say, he's alive. Why are you looking for him among the dead? But the question remains to those of us that are in this natural realm. Those of us who live in this world, we are going to look through eyes that are locked into a reality that is of this natural world. Let me say that again so we get that. Those of us who live in this world look through eyes that are locked into the reality of this natural world. So why is this question more real to us than the answer? Why is the question more real to us than the answer? The question again, why do you seek the one who's alive among the dead? That is more real to us than he is risen, he is risen, or he is not here. It's more real to us because of a few things today. The first reason is it's more real to us because death is finality to us. Death is finality to us. The finality of death is a reality. We've all experienced it in one way or another. Every one of us, in one way or another, has experienced the finality of death. We get it. We simply drive by a cemetery, and we see the finality of death. We see tombstones. We see the finality of death. We even have phrases that are said in our culture, like this person's final resting place. We have planning for your final days. We have opportunities for you to do pre-planning for your final thought. We have phrases like last words. We have last will and testament. Final wishes. What was that person's final wishes? And the list goes on and on. But all those phrases have wired us to think of the reality of death. And we say them because we grasp that. The end, the finality of life. We look at Scripture, and it teaches the finality of death. It's not something that we just came up with. It starts in Genesis, the second chapter, the 15th verse. What does God say? The Lord God placed the man in the Garden of Eden, watch, tend, and watch over it. But the Lord warned him, you may freely eat the fruit of every tree in the garden, except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If you eat its fruit, you are sure to die. You are sure to die. And that, that doesn't just stop there, and we watch as that takes place throughout the Scripture, but it doesn't just stop with Genesis and the announcement there. It goes on to the prophets in the book of Ezekiel, the 18th chapter. You will see these words. The prophet Ezekiel says in verse 1, Then another message came to me from the Lord. Why do you quote this proverb concerning the land of Israel? The parents have eaten sour grapes, but their children's mouths pucker at the taste. As surely as I live, says the sovereign Lord, you will not quote this proverb anymore in Israel. For all people are mine to judge, both parents and children alike. And this is my rule. The person who sins is the one who will die. The person who sins is the one who will die. So not only did God say it in Genesis, the finality, God then repeats it through the Proverbs, or or through the prophets. And then we go to the poetry books of the Old Testament. You look at Psalm, the 90th chapter. 
Psalm, the 90th chapter, written by Moses, a man who would lead the children of Israel out of Egypt and into the promised land. And as he's leading them, we know what takes place. They're out there 40 years, and a whole generation dies in the wilderness. Numerous people. Moses had a good understanding of what it was like to do funerals. He has all of these people who die in the wilderness. Psalm 90. Look at what he says in this, what is called a funeral psalm. Verse 10. Seventy years are given to us. Some even live to eighty. But even the best years are filled with pain and trouble. Soon they disappear and we fly away. Who can comprehend the power of your anger? Your wrath is, an awesome, is as awesome as the, as the fear you deserve. Teach us to realize the brevity of life so that we may grow in wisdom. Some versions say, teach us to number our days that we may walk in wisdom. New Living says, teach us the brevity of life. Help us to understand it's very temporary. As you go over just another couple books, you come to Ecclesiastes, where Solomon will say very familiar scriptures that maybe we've even heard at a funeral service. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, 1 and 2. We find for everything there is a season, a time for activity under heaven. And the first thing he says, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant, a time to harvest. And then he will go on and continue with other things, other times in the midst of the season of life. But he starts with a time to be born and a time to die. The finality of death is ever before us. Solomon says there's a time for it. It doesn't just stop there, though. You can continue, and you go over to the New Testament, Romans, the fifth chapter. The apostle Paul will talk to us about this as well. Romans 5, verse 12, he will say these words in Romans 5, verse 12. When Adam sinned, sin entered the world. Adam's sin brought death. So death spread to everyone, for everyone sinned. And then you flip over one chapter in Romans, the sixth chapter. We're familiar with this scripture. We've heard it before. Romans 6, 23. The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ or Christ Jesus, our Lord. The wages of sin is death. That reads much like what Ezekiel said. The soul that sins will die. It reads what Genesis said. If you do this, you will die. It reads what Solomon said in Ecclesiastes, a time to die. In James, the fourth chapter, the 13th and 14th verse, he says, look here, you say today or tomorrow, we are going to a certain town and we'll stay there a year. We will do business there and make a profit. How do you know that your life will be like tomorrow? Your life is like a morning fog, the morning fog. It's here a little while, then it's gone. James says, life is temporary. You will die. You cannot predict the future. He said, because it is uncertain. Death is a finality. But if that's not enough, Jesus himself will show us the finality of death. In John the 8th chapter, John the 8th chapter, Jesus talking to the religious leaders will say these words in John 8, 21. Later, Jesus said to them again, I'm going away. You will search for me, but will die in your sin. You come where I am going. You cannot come where I am going. The people ask, is he planning to commit suicide? What does he mean? You cannot come where I'm going. Jesus continued, you are from below. I am from above. You belong to this world. I do not. This is why I said to you, you will die in your sins. For unless you believe that I am who I claim to be, you will die in your sins. Now we say, after reading all those scriptures, thank you, Pastor, so much for the words of encouragement today. Yay, it's wonderful. We've heard all about death. But see, that's what we have to deal with. It's there in front of us. It's very clear of the finality of death. Jesus is talking about both spiritual and physical death. Romans, he's talking about both physical and spiritual death. It's why the ladies came to the tomb in Luke, the 24th chapter. They came with spices to do what? 
to prepare the body. They came with the expectation of the finality of death. That was their expectation. They decided in their hearts, we need to go to the graveside. We need to go to the place of death and do what we're supposed to do for a dead body. That was their expectation. Which brings us to the second thing I want us to understand. Why the question, why do you seek the living among the dead? Why that's more real to us is not only the finality of death, but the second thing today is that believing is difficult when you're standing at the tomb. Believing is difficult when you're standing at the tomb. He's asking this question, why are you looking? It's a simple answer. Because we don't believe the words about raising from the dead. We don't really believe. And so as a result, these ladies are saying, we are here to pay respects to a dead person. See, standing in the tombs, when you're standing in the midst of the graveyard, belief that anything greater could happen is difficult. When you're standing in the midst of the tombstones, it's difficult to believe anything could really happen. And Jesus has the answer when we're standing in the midst of the tombs. When we don't know where to go from here, and he shared it with someone who was standing in the midst of tombs. It's in John, the 11th chapter. Jesus is going to come up on Lazarus' death, and he's going to talk to Lazarus' sister. In John, the 11th chapter, the, 20, the 17th verse, here's what he says. When Jesus arrived in Bethany, he was told that Lazarus had already been in his grave for four days. Bethany was only a few miles down the road from Jerusalem. And many of the people had come to console Martha and Mary in their loss. Martha and Mary are Lazarus' sisters. When Martha got word that Jesus was coming, she went to meet him, but Mary stayed in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if only you had been here, my brother would not have died. If you had been here, he would not have met finality. But even now, I know that God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus told her, your brother will rise again. Yes, Martha said, he will rise when everyone else rises in the last day. Stop there for just a moment. She says, I believe in the final resurrection. I believe, but I'm looking, I'm standing in the tombs and I'm looking at death. And I, I, I believe he will do in the final resurrection. But listen to the words that Jesus says to her. Jesus told her, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live even after dying. Everyone who lives in me and believes in me will never, ever die. Do you believe this, Martha? Do you really believe this? Do you believe that I am the one who can take your whys when they are closing in on you and bring you truth and bring you hope and bring you comfort of the resurrection hope? And here is the transition point that Jesus is making with Martha. And it's the transition point for all of us as we look at death and the finality of death. Here it is. He says, I want you to understand life, and I want you to understand that when life brings you a why, I am moving in to show you who I am. When life brings you the why of death, I am showing up to appear to you and let you see the who of who I am. I want you to understand that. And that moment of understanding is what it really means when you hear these words. He isn't here. And that's how we begin to apply it to our lives today. The question is more real. Why do you seek the living among the dead? And Jesus says, if you're going to understand the answer, you're going to have to go from this realm of the reality and the finality of death. You're going to have to go from the reality of the why when you're standing among the tombs. And you're going to have to go to a new reality of thinking. And he says, the new reality of thinking is this. I am the resurrection and the life. Even though people die, they live in me. That's the resurrection hope. And I have to get you to see that because when you see that, you will understand this greater reality. He isn't here. 
He is risen from the dead, which brings us to the third point today, and that is this, very important, supernatural intersections overturn natural results. Supernatural intersections overturn natural results. See, death is a reality. It's a finality in the natural. But where God intersects our lives through death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, something supernatural, something powerful takes place that overturns that natural result. And we find it in a few scriptures today that I want us to look at. Colossians, the second chapter, the Apostle Paul writes these words to us. Colossians 2, 13. You were dead because of your sins and because your sinful nature was not yet cut away. Then God made you alive with Christ, for he forgave all our sins. He canceled the record of the charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. In this way, he disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities. He shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross. He said, because Jesus died, you and I have been freed from the spiritual death that comes as a result of our sins. He canceled the record of all the charges against us. He said, I'm going to take everything you've done and every penalty that should be yours, and I'm taking it away through the cross. But then he goes on to say these words in Ephesians, the second chapter. In Ephesians, the second chapter, the first verse, once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins. You used to live in sin, just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers of the, in the unseen world. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. All of us used to live that way, following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature. By our very nature, we were subject to God's anger, just like everyone else. And then these two great words, but God, but God is so rich in mercy and he loved us so much that even though we were, here it is, dead because of our sins, he gave us life, how? When he raised Christ from the dead. It's only by God's grace that you've been saved. For he raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ Jesus. We were dead in our sins, the finality. We were raised up. Why? Because we identify with Jesus through his death on the cross, but now we also get to identify with him in his resurrection from the grave. We are made free. And that's the celebration of our new life in Christ. That's why Easter is the celebration and crowning moment of Christianity. Because through his death, his burial, and his resurrection, we can say we are no longer here. We are no longer in the grave. He isn't here. He's risen from the dead. That's our story now. Because why? Supernatural intersections overturn natural results. Those ladies, when they came to the tomb that day, the angelic being said to them, there has been a supernatural intersection that has taken place here. You will not find the living among the dead. He is not here. He is risen. Your question that we're asking is, why are you seeking the living among the dead? Because in the spiritual realm, when there is a supernatural intersection, it overturns the natural results. And Numerous people who are listening and watching this message have experienced that. Your testimony is a picture of that. Let me just share with you one testimony of a brother here in our body. And I want you to hear his testimony. It's a picture of this very thought of death, burial, and resurrection. He says this, I'm originally from St. Charles, Missouri, grew up in Wichita for the majority of my life the fifth child of seven children. As long as I can remember, my parents were married but lived in separate houses. For me, it led to very much an insecure life. I was not confident in anything other than eating a lot. This led to insecurities about my size. When you're the oversized kid starting to like girls and they only like the skinny boys, 
That led me to a further lack of confidence and insecurities with myself. In my late teens and early 20s, I dealt with depression and suicidal thoughts. But I never told anyone because I was too strong for that. That pride led me into deeper, into the rabbit hole of depression, anger, and frustration. Drug usage and alcohol consumption were the closest thing to comfort that could find, I could find for the longest time. I knew I would not live past my mid-20s. I met Christ at a conference when I was 16 years old, and even then, I still felt burdened by the chain of, I'm not good enough. When will someone see me for who I am? I knew I was a Christian now, and that my salvation was secured. It just wasn't until I met my wife that I started to understand the love of Christ. She showed me the level of love and respect that Christ was for her. She encouraged me in that. She encouraged me that I needed to go deeper in my faith. And that's when I really, really met Jesus Christ. He put people in my life that poured into my life and encouraged me. I was drowning in a love and a level of acceptance that I had never knew existed. And this is what I had been looking for. And today, I stand as a man of God, a husband of God, a father of God. I'm a hunter of God. I'm an HVAC tech of God. My identity in every aspect is of God. Everything that I am, I am because of God. I can walk my, with my head held high knowing that I am free of depression. My confidence is in knowing that my God goes before me, beside me, and after me. I am alive today because he lives today. This man is free. Why? Because he's no longer in the grave. We can look at his life and say, he isn't here. He is risen from the dead. He has come out of the reality of death, and into the reality of resurrection life in Jesus Christ. Something that every one of us hearing this message today can do. And how do we do that? Simple. Romans, the 10th chapter, the ninth verse says these words. If you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is by believing in your heart that you, made right, you are made right with God. It is by openly declaring your faith that you are saved. What does he say? If you can believe that God raised him from the dead, salvation comes. Why did Paul say that? Because he said that because we live in the finality of death. And we find ourselves hopeless at times in the midst of the tombs. But he says, if you can understand that Jesus Christ paid a sacrificial price for your sin and my sin. And he did so on the cross, but he didn't stay there. And he was buried and he didn't stay there. He rose again. That supernatural work, if you are willing to intersect that supernatural work, it overturns the natural reaction, the natural result. And you will have a supernatural life change. And it will bring you hope. And it will give you life in the midst of the finality of death. He is alive today. That's what we celebrate. And he can be alive in you today as you're willing to understand and receive his love and acknowledge that his resurrection is real. His resurrection is your grace and your hope. He brings you out of the tomb and into newness of life. He's alive. He isn't here. He's been risen from the dead. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for the opportunity to share your word today. Thank you for your people being willing to hear your word. Minister to us today by your grace and mercy. Touch those who hear this message today that they can experience the newness that only Jesus Christ can offer in the midst of the finality of death. They can hear today the words of truth that Jesus Christ can set them free and bring them out of the hopelessness of their life into hope in you. We thank you for your grace and mercy. In Jesus' name, amen.